righty then. Well, for <laughs> posterity reasons only, uh, this is Art and Gibberish, volume number eight. It is now 2022, and it's some kind of October-ish type thing, and it's, uh, I usually say Potato Water Thursday, because that's when we do this, so, <laughs> but it's actually Friday today, but don't tell anyone, because uh, we're going to have potato water anyways, and uh, <laughs> we're in the house here, and guess who's uh, rolled into town from way out of town? I have the absolutely stunningly beautiful uh, Miss, Miss, Mrs., Mr., Miss. I don't know what to call anybody anymore. I don't. You pick your own bathroom, whatever you want. I don't care. Just wash your hands, please, okay? Cindy Revel is in the house. Hey, hey. <laughs> All right. Hi. Hi. Thank you for coming. That's so good. You're in town, and I roped you into doing this. I gave you enough beer and promised I'd <laughs> give you more beer, and you showed up. That's awesome. I'm glad you're here. Always willing. All right. Okay. So, uh, where do we go? Let's, uh, what's on your easel today? What's on my easel? Oh, I'm painting a 30 by 60 painting. Ooh, that's very big. I don't normally go that big, but I'm going to give it a whirl. All right. I've when, what are you, what, uh, what are you painting? Um, a table round with, uh, a round table, yeah, 30 by 60, must be thin. Very thin. <laughs> Dahlias, fruit, birds, and a chair. All right, that sounds like something so, you'd paint. It does, doesn't it? It does. But, you know, I'll tell you something. Doing these things that you don't ordinarily do are really good because cause suddenly now I'm stretching how I, th how I think. <laughs> stretching. <laughs> no, it's true, though. It's true. I've, I, I go through the phase where... I don't know. And people say, well, how do you determine what size you're going to paint? I seem to paint in phases mm -hmm. uh, where I do small paintings and sometimes they're meeting and all of a sudden they're big. But it's it's weird how uh, if you paint a bunch of five by sevens, an eight by 10 can feel like a wall mural. Yeah. And if you're painting 30 by 40, an eight by 10 can feel like a postage stamp. Yeah, that's true. But But you just... But it's good to do other sizes and 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 stretch your wings and uh, it shakes you up. It does a little bit and yeah. and we need that. Yeah. painting can can get very rutty. Oh, it certainly can. You know, yeah. and and I always say ride the wave. That I did this painting. Wow, that was good. I'm doing another one. Whoa, that's yeah. super good. And then you ride the wave. But I always say, yeah, that that wave wave comes down and you crash. Yeah, and it's like then you do one and like, well, that sucks. And then you're like, I don't want to do that anymore. That's What's right. Next? Do something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you do have to find different ways to shake yourself up. But riding the wave is not bad. It's a it's a good way to make sure you're creating inventory or or just getting to the easel every day. Like some people are kind of waiting for inspiration. Um, I don't think you should be waiting for inspiration. I think you just need to get your butt to the easel. So that's a good um, question then. <clears throat> what uh, do you? Uh, do you go in with a plan to paint or like, what, what do you do? I like get up and go, I'm painting this or go, no, I have to do this, this and this, and maybe I'll get to that. Like, do you, like, what, what, what do you do when, what's your, what's your sort of process? Well, it really depends on what's going on. So if I have um, a show or some particular reason that I have to have something painted, then I have a plan and I'll usually sort of come up with different ideas about what I want to paint for it. That was loud. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm Leroy. He's Leroy behind the camera. <laughs> There's always something wrong. <laughs> Just kidding. That's all right. It's all good. Technical case. Okay, so keep going. Yeah. So I usually have a plan if there's something to plan for. If there isn't, um, I consult my gigantic stack of, of sketches and can shuffle through there and find something to paint. Do you, do you ever go to bed with a thought going, oh, I'm getting up tomorrow and painting this? Um, nope. I usually, but I wake up with thoughts. And when do you paint? What What's your, do you have, a, are you a, a timely painter or are you just anytime? Um. Do you feed the chickens in the morning? You have chickens, do you? Do you get up I and do feed have your chickens. chickens? Okay. Well, since you've asked. <laughs> <laughs> I get up. I do Qigong. What's that? It's an exercise. It's like mahjong. You play. You get up and play no, mahjong online. It's it's an exercise related to tai chi. Oh, cool! So I do that for about fifteen minutes or so while the kettle is boiling. I make my tea. I sit in my chair, which is a, as you may recall, is directly across right. from my easel, and I think about art. Is I, it a meditative type <clears throat> thing too? No. 
Of nope. Qigong? Yeah. Um, it should be. <laughs> I'm not very good at meditating. I'm always thinking, maybe I shouldn't be doing it in my studio, which is where I do it. And of course, I'm thinking about art all the time. Yeah, yeah. So it's a little, maybe it's a bad place to do it, but I do it there. That's the way it's going to stay. Anyway, when that's done, I go to my chair and I, with my tea, and I sit across from my easel and I think about what I'm going to be teaching my students. Um, it is a very fruitful time for me because I come up with a million ideas then. I'll, I, I could sit there for hours. I have to force myself to get up and go to work because the ideas roll in one after another. My stack of ideas for paintings is so high I think I need a better system, but it so far it seems to be working. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so eventually I realized, oh my God, you better get to work. <laughs> so I go get my, I get in my pajamas and uh, I, I either start to paint or, or if I have some other pressing work stuff that needs to be done, I do that. But I'm, I'm really coming to the conclusion that pressing work stuff is actually not pressing. The most pressing thing should be whatever is on my easel. And then that other pressing stuff will simply have to wait. <laughs> yeah, right? Yes. <laughs> because I have, yeah. for some reason, I always feel guilty about admin stuff, like updating website and Instagram and all that crap. But I, I do all that crap when I'm done painting, when I'm tired, because I don't need a brain to do that. It's it's hard and whatever. Yeah. And, and but But I don't, it's not creative for me. It's not creative. So I do it. You know, in the afternoon or sometimes after dinner, I'll sit and putz with it. Or if I if I just can't paint, I'll do it. But I don't want to waste my good creative time on that. That's interesting because I have this. I'm, I'm sure I'm part push me, pull you. Remember Dr. Seuss's push mm -hmm. me, pull you? Okay. I think I'm a part push me, pull you. Because half of me wants to go to the easel and get going in all these thousands of ideas that I've come up with that I'll never get to in all my life. The other half of me, the good girl, says, you have all this stuff that you should do. You should go do that. And then you can reward yourself by painting. So yeah, I'm, so that never works. It, no. it never works because you no. do all that and then other shit happens and you never That's get to right. the painting part. Yeah. So I would say, just thinking about it, it, it's a, it was a twofold thing for me that uh, the first thing that happened was i don't know if you know that jason jason horse jason horse whatever xanadu gallery i do the, i'm in the xanadu gallery i know him well he's great you got in xanadu gallery he took your work oh i hate you i'm podcast so over <laughs> i don't like her anymore he invited me your work would go so good in there that's fantastic <laughs> have you sold work out of there i do oh my god i love you that's so great i hate you at the same time that's a push me okay, pull you i love it, you i hate you does it It'll, you'll you'll like me a little bit more if I tell you that it doesn't sell super fast. It's, none it's, of none of it ever su sells super <laughs> fast. I wish it did, but um, oh no, that's fantastic. But he's he's so smart. He's very smart well, and marketing and so stuff. When we I, I brought him to Calgary after I did his course and whatever, I, I actually I brought him. To, I, I think twice we had him to Calgary and. That was the first time we went off site and we filled the location. I put 60 people. Oh my God, I was so scary and whatever. We <laughs> filled it up. It was fantastic. But the thing I learned from him was he says, I don't do my emails till four o'clock. And I do my yeah. emails at four o'clock because I've done all my other business and everything else that's important. Emails aren't important. He goes, there's never anything important in an email. You can always answer it later, whatever. He goes, I start emails in the morning and next thing I know it's noon. I haven't done shit all at work that I should have done. I'm answering stupid emails. And he said, so I answer emails from four till five to 5.30 at night. And that's it. At 5.30, I'm done. If I haven't answered them, I will answer them tomorrow. When I get into work in the morning, I do sales stuff and sell paintings. And he goes, and the emails can wait. And I was like, that's absolutely amazing. What I took away from that was I used to get up in the morning and do my emails. First, like, I'll do my emails and I'll do this and I'll do that. And then once I get all the shit out of my life, then I'll go downstairs and paint. So the second thing I would say to that is then I read the book, The, uh, the War on Art by Stephen Pressfield. And he said that that's resistance and resistance is at your door every day, knocking at your door. It'll never go away. And I realized that, yeah, resistance is there. I can never get to the painting because there's always some resistance. How do you beat resistance? <laughs> yeah. 
And as you see, all these guys tell you, get your ass out of bed in the morning and go do what you need to do. So I started getting up at five in the morning, six in the morning, and going downstairs to paint before the phone rings, before the door knocks, before the emails start going ding, ding, ding. And so I've been doing this for probably over four years now. I get up and ask anyone, you ask anyone, they wake up and go, no, he's down. He's always fine downstairs painting. He's yeah. down there every day. It's like going to the gym. The hard part about go, going to the gym is not the gym. The gym is not the hard part. The hard part is getting to the gym. Once you're in the gym, you work out. It's kind of good. You leave the gym going, wow, I feel good. That was actually really good. But resistance stops you from going. So no more emails in the morning. Thank you, Jason. Steven, get your ass out of bed. Go downstairs and paint. At nine o'clock, when I start hearing the ding, 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 I'm like, eh, I painted for a couple hours and I got some work done. I organized some shit. I'm hungry. Let's go have some toast and peanut butter and answer emails. I'm good. Yeah. Rest of the day can happen. I paint, period. That comes first primary in my life. Other, everything else comes second. Okay, I'm off my soapbox. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Good night. <laughs> Thanks for coming out Good and listening night. to the Doug show, not the Cindy show. <laughs> Anyways, your turn. Go ahead. I have to agree. Yeah. So <laughs> do you paint in the mornings? Do you paint in the afternoons or do you? Both. Do you wear pants when you paint? I wear jeans. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding you. Uh, that's awesome. Well, I so, could have. Uh, well, sometimes I've been known to wear pajamas, but there's something very, I feel very slothful if I'm painting in my pajamas. They so. say that too. Yeah, I wouldn't say I dress up when I paint, but I do put at least some pants on and whatever. Yeah. But but yeah, you could you could like they say like you know, the whole pandemic thing about people doing work in their pajamas and whatever. And lots of people would say, I really just it didn't work out. Like yeah. I I felt like I needed a shower and to put on clothes and go to a separate room and work because that's an environment. And people were sitting in their kitchen stuffing a bagel down <laughs> and curlers, going, "Yeah, get this work done, whatever." You know what it does. When you get dressed to go to the easel, it sets the tone. Mm -hmm. If you're in your pajamas, <clears throat> the tone's off. Yeah, for sure. It's not quite right. You need to get your pants on. Your sh your it's work. You're going to work. Right. You're going your to do on something. Or whatever yeah. the hell you're going to wear in your apron. And, and It'd be like showing up to the gym in your pajamas. That's eh, right. It might work out a little bit here or whatever. <laughs> it's, in some, it's almost like in the back of your mind when you're not focus like that like dressed and everything to paint it's almost like there's a little thing in the back of your mind that's i'm not serious about totally it, right totally <clears throat> not that art should always be you know knock you down drop dead serious you got i mean for me it's got to have a sense of play about it absolutely but at the same time the paintings have to get made yes and so the clothes have to come but it's on. a little bit of that <clears throat> that when you put on you know, it's Friday night and you put on some better clothes to go out. You kind of feel a little bit better about yourself. You Absolutely. Feel, yeah, I'm That's good. Right. I feel good. Right. Yeah. yeah. You're going to go in with the toothbrush sticking out of your mouth and fuzzy <laughs> slippers going, eh, hey, I should put some red here. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's just not the same. I would say that the muse that comes to help you paint, that comes in and says, we love you. We want to make your painting joyous. They come in and go, what? You're in your pajamas again? I'm out. I don't want to be there. So nothing's yeah. going to happen. You're not, you're not. Telling them I'm serious. The headspace is so important. It is. I don't think very we important. realize how important that is, but yeah, it's, it is. it's kind of the boss. And if you set the tone in the studio for, I get up, I get dressed, I walk in the studio. The minute you go in, the brain goes, "Oh yeah, this again." I totally know what we're doing here. Yeah, very serious. I know what we're doing. Every day you go in there, instead of like, I don't know, what are we doing in here now? I thought we were doing dishes, or <laughs> weren't we washing the underwear? I, well, now what are we doing? All right, blue. Okay, whatever. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, okay. So I'm going to tell you a little story. This is one of those things. Uh, you have one of those things that anyone says to you, do you have any regrets in your life? And if you could do life over again, what would you do? Here's a really strange thing that I'm going to tell you. Um, so you came to classes with me for a while and you went to a Soyuz to paint. You came outdoor painting in a Soyuz. This is like a, a long time ago. ago. A long time ago when we were painting and we went up on a hill at a winery to paint and everybody's painting this epic scene <laughs> everywhere and I, I come along that. and you're painting a yield sign. That's and I was right. like, what the fuck are you doing, man? A I'm like, what are you going to paint the sign? I'm like, I'm not normal. I'm like, like 
Do you see what's out there? It wasn't a yield sign. There is the most beautiful scene you've ever seen in your life. And you're painting a rickety old yield sign, which is very artistic. And for some reason, we argued about that and had a thing. And I told you to paint that. You tried and it didn't do so good. And then you paint the sign. The sign was wonderful. I don't think I knew you that well. And now everything that you paint and I see who you are, I'm like... Why would you ever tell her to paint something that when she wanted to paint it? Like, I, I, I have still guilt about that. You should probably get over it. I know I should, but it was like, I, I told you, not, you to, child. not to paint that because like, I'm like, why would you like, I just is so confused, but I was so young then too. And but, but you were there to teach people about the landscape. And plan I know, your but I told you not to paint a yellow sign, and I, I have guilt about that. So if I could ever go back again, yes, I'd learn how to play guitar again, <laughs> and yes, I would have let you paint the yellow sign. I, I apologize now. Guilt be gone. Yeah, guilt be gone, because it didn't phase me at all, but I do remember it, and I have a photo of those signs. Oh, that's too funny. See, <laughs> that is a memory. All right. Yeah. All oh, right. I, well, to me, they were just so exciting and colorful. Well, and Couldn't... I see what you paint now, <laughs> and it's amazing the things you can put together in a painting and make them work. Well, they don't always work, but... Oh, well, we all have that. I <laughs> oh, they don't always work. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. All right. That's, oh, yeah. It's funny how uh, people think... They just assume that if you've been painting for a long time, everything works out, but no, it doesn't. <laughs> Oh, I, that's the, I call that the Fleetwood Mac problem. It's like, oh my God, Fleetwood Mac, it's the greatest band ever. And you get their greatest hits, pa greatest hits package, 20 songs. It's like, my God, every one of these songs is amazing. And that spans, you know, <laughs> 20 years of their career. And I'm like, 20 years, you got 20 songs. And I yeah. go, well, yeah, they had 20 albums. And so you got one song, an album, you had 12 songs on an album, and then you put f the other 35 went in the garbage and some went in the can, some are there. Like, it's it's like, again, art books. You open an art book. Oh, my God. So good. Oh, my God. So good. You don't see all the barf that they went through and the things right. that they threw out <clears throat> and that, you know, like I just, it's the, the Fleetwood Mac thing. It Only one, one or two songs per album actually make it. Then there's a couple that are good. You know, and then the other ones are just filler. They're just filler. And then all the ones that didn't make it, right? And everybody looks and thinks, oh, my God, you're so good. Everything you do is so good. And it's like, oh, God, it's no. No. The flops lead you to the successes. They do. And I, I just some days I, I keep thinking. I remember talking to the, the, the one of the greatest Canadian artists ever still. Robert, if you're out there, I love you, baby. Robert McGinnis. He used to live in Calgary. lives in, uh, I think he's in Winnipeg. He might be in Montreal. I'm back in Montreal now. Well, he was in Winnipeg for a while. Anyways, I remember him. We had his 65th birthday party, I think. And afterwards, we went back to his house. And after just about everyone gone, there's just a couple of us there. And we're talking. And he goes, this painting, this painting. Yeah, I really like these ones. He goes, you know... I think I'm finally starting to get it. And I thought to myself, <laughs> what? You're 65 and you're only just getting it? Like, what? What? And now I realize, oh, no, you'll always oh. be only. If you live only just beginning to get it, you'll always do good. There's yeah. always more to learn, always more challenges. Otherwise, you're just going to start painting repetitious and it's going to get boring. It'll be like paint by number. It will be. You it's always have to happens. have something exciting to be going Challenging for. Challenging and, and a, and a that's fight. Right. That's that's why this 30 by 60 painting that I'm doing is so exciting. Right? So, and, like, so what's hmm. the inspiration? You wake up one morning and go, I got to go big. I feel it. No, one of my galleries said you should do a 30 by 60. I'm like, oh, all right. Webster's. No, Art Artem in Ar Invermere. Artem. Artem. <clears throat> Artem. Hi, Connie. <laughs> I agree. Anyways, I love those two. So do I. They're pretty funny. All but, right. But yeah, she suggested 30 by 60. I'm like, okay, sure, I'll do that. Awesome. It just really stretches your brains. It's good stuff. So it's just funny you say that. I I had a teacher tell me one time, our teacher said, it takes a, it takes 100 miles of canvas before you'll become a good painter. And I thought, is that for real? 100 miles, buddy, 100 miles of canvas, then you'll be a good painter. I went that day to the art store, and I bought a 40 by 70. <laughs> and I thought, I'm getting this done right away. We're going to paint long and get this done. Apparently, that's not That's a, not really what he meant. No, not at all. <laughs> but good try. Yeah. All right. <laughs> all right. How is, uh, so where are you? You're, we always, we just, we Edmonton adopted you, but you're not in Edmonton. 
Well, I'm from, I'm outside of Edmonton. Where were you born? Where was I born? Uh, Arborfield, Saskatchewan. A what? Never even heard of it. Well, no, nobody has. It's pretty small. (laughs) Leroy, go to, what is it? Arborfield? Arborfield. Leroy? uh, Take Leroy and go there. Look up Leroy and Leroy behind the camera. They're funny. They go to Saskatchewan and (laughs) film funny signs. But anyways, Arborfield? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Where is that? It's a small town near where I was raised, which is Kit River, which is Mm. also very small. Obviously, I've never heard of that either, and I know a lot of places. Mm. I was raised on a farm. And wh- give me a landmark that's at least close to there. Nippon? Oh, I, Nippon, of course. I've taught in Nippon many times. Get out. I have. I, Jack, the big Jack Fish Festival every yes, year? Yes, right the in fishing. the provincial park right there. Yes, yeah. great. So a friend of mine, Rhonda, who used to be the park ranger in Canmore, is is the park ranger for Nippon, but she oh. paints, so she's had me come out, and I've painted... Oh, awesome. I've done many workshops in Nippo, and it's beautiful. I love it. Isn't it? Yeah, it is it beautiful. Is, it is pretty. I love it. I love the drive going home. It's just fant- It's so weird because when I'm going back to Saskatchewan, I say I'm going home, and then when I'm coming back to Alberta, I say I'm coming home. Yeah, well, yeah. It's all, it's all home. I know the whole valley was nice. <laughs> oh. The up, the up toppy part, it's good too, but it's one of the few places you can literally, honestly say, if you lost your dog, you could watch it run away for three days. <laughs> I, it depends where you go because because I am uh, well my family's farm where my brother lives now is east of Carrot River which that's east of so or southeast of Nippon and and it really isn't that way there's there's hills and there's lots of trees and if you're how far southeast are we talking oh not Prince Albert or oh, gee, no? no not no, that okay. far it's only like three quarters of an hour oh okay but if you're looking uh, east you can see the 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 hump of the Pasqua Hills. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, it's oh. Remind me to show you. I've saved. I saved some pictures. One of my friends from home uh, took some incredible pictures, and I was just thinking about your trip to Quebec, and these photos. If they don't rival that, well, something's wrong. Oh, I want to see these. Unbelie- I'm all about that. Yeah. All right. So don't let don't let us forget, Ryan. They're right. so pretty. So you go. Where'd you go to high school? Well, a little town called Carrot River. Jewish Carrot River High. High. All right. Yeah. Go. Go Carrot River Green Tops. Woo. <laughs> I, don't I don't think we have any green tops. Go Carrot River Beavers. Yeah. I don't Ew. know. Ew. <laughs> All right. How, so uh, how would you end up in Edmonton? Um, well, there was nothing going on in Carrot River. Um, so my parents sent me here to find a job. <laughs> get out. Go get a job. <laughs> Pretty much. Like, see ya. Tractor or go get a job? Hmm. They, so I was supposed to, they wanted me to go to art school right away. Oh, they did? Did they you go did. to art school? Well, not then. I, I, I graduated a little bit young and I really wasn't in the mood to go to school. So I kind of bucked a little bit and said, no, I'm not going to art school. So they were a little bit peeved with me. And so I did some waitressing and stuff. That was horrible. Um, and then they sent me out to Edmonton to live with an aunt where I got a job and I did some other horrible jobs, which they're not horrible. They're horrible for me. So I What's the worst job you ever had? The worst. Well, I didn't like any of them. I didn't like retail because it was boring. I didn't like. Uh, I worked at Alberta Mortgage and Housing. Like, oh, you sweet mother of pearl. <laughs> it's just nothing but numbers and crabby people. It's just, just utterly ghastly. Then I went to work Alberta Mortgage and Housing. Equally ghastly. More numbers. I worked at a a. a, a an insurance company, more numbers. Mm-hmm. So I've learned I hate numbers. And so I, so that would only last a few years. And I thought, well, I guess I better go to art college because this is just horrible. And God bless all of you people out there that do that stuff because I can't. It's awful for me. I have to. I'm a Oh, creative. God bless accountants. My oh. God. Oh, God bless accountants. Oh, I'd die without mine. I'd die without like, my accountants too. Oh, my God. Yeah. I'd, be in t- I'd be in Canada Revenue Jail right now without mine. Yeah, got to have the number, people. You could be my cellmate. That'd be cool. Sure, that would be interesting. (laughs) Right. So, yeah, so I went to art college. Best thing ever. I thought, yes, this this is my life. And then I went on to get a job um, at at a print company. That was good. Taught me some very basic things. And I went on to get another job as a graphic designer and illustrator and photographer. Also good. Also taught me some basic things. But what I was learning that I didn't want to go to work every day and I didn't like working for other people. 
And so, and I had always sort of had in the back of my mind that I wanted to be an illustrator. And so I started working on my portfolio every night and just, and the portfolio that I was working on never went anywhere. I was actually painting really fat cats for cards. I was. <laughs> you still paint fat cats. I know. Isn't that funny? So, oh, I'll have to tell you. Remind me to tell you the story about the, the, the business plan on the ruled paper. Okay. It's very funny. Well, it's not funny. It's interesting. Anyway, so I worked on my portfolio that didn't go anywhere because then I discovered from a friend of mine how, how difficult at that time it was to deal with reading cards and, and restocking and all that stuff. So I just sort of fell into freelancing for advertising companies. And then that made me realize, well, I really like doing this. And so I did more of it, and eventually I quit my job and I started freelancing. And okay, so now I can now I actually re, I'm remembering the ruled line thing. Okay, go. Amazing how I can never remember anything these days. Oh well, that's, oh. you know that's oh. uh, that's CRS disease. Oh my God! At you any get rate, to stage, you get I remember that. Yeah. So this is probably sometime around '97, and. I was just getting serious about, well, I'd already quit my job and I thought, okay, I got to get serious about this. And, you know, so, and somebody said, you have to have a business plan. All right. So I got a piece of uh, lined paper and I wrote, uh, I think age 40, I wanted to have done illustrated for magazine covers and, and just magazines in general. And then between 40 and 50, I wanted to illustrate children's books. And then sometime around 50 or later, I wanted to illustrate cats. But illustrate I didn't, cats. Yes. And, but I had no clue in my mind what, what I would be doing, what they would look like, what they would be on. I, I, just, I just knew I kind of, that was a trajectory I wanted to go on. And then I, I, I guess I lost the piece of paper, which I found a few years just recently. But anyway, it was very interesting. When I ran across that piece of paper, I noticed that, oh, look at that. All of the pieces fell nicely into place. You've done every one of those I things. I did do those things. You've done every one of them. But they didn't work out. Not one of those things really worked out the way I thought it would. What did you, what, what did you think they were going to do? Well, they did, though. They, you... Well, they did, just not in the way that I sort of planned. Well, I guess I didn't have a very solid plan. I guess I just didn't see myself, I didn't see myself as a fine artist. That's what it was. It never occurred to me that I would end up becoming but a fine artist. But you're one of those cool artists that's blurred those lines. I suppose. Because you have an extremely illustrative style. It is. Yet, if I was one of those music critics that had to say, I have to put you in a genre, you know, I would say, oh, she's, you know, uh, kind of hip hop, but pop. You know, it, but you're, Ew. you're, but you're in, well, I don't know. I didn't listen to any crap. I just listened to rock, whatever. But I mean, I mean, you, but you, you have a very illustrative style. That's a very fine art. And you walk that edge all the time between some paintings are very f pure fine art. And some of them are, are almost pure illustrative. And some of them dance around between there. And I think the, the ones that dance around in between are the most exciting ones that, that I love. I'm like, God, I could see this in a book, but I could see this as a giant painting as well. I think you do a marvelous job with that. Oh, thanks Doug. Yeah, no, you have a really cool style. I, I really, I really like that. And very different from everyone else. You know, what's weird is the one thing I absolutely never imagined was that I would become an oil painter or that I would be painting realism. But you don't really paint realism. Not anymore, but that's, but that's where I started. Like, I, I started painting realism. So, so I was illustrating away, life is good, yippee, painting, illustrating children's books. I thought, this is cool, yep, yep, yep. But I'm, I, obvious, I didn't know it at the time, but I, obviously I'm one of these people that, if I've done it, I'm starting to get a little bit bored with it. So I was getting a little bit bored with illustration. I thought, well, this is all, oh, this is fun, yeah, but I think I need something to shake me up a little bit. So I thought, I'm going to change my medium from acrylic to oil. So I, I do a painting, absolutely effing horrible, <laughs> horrible in every way. So I thought, I need help. So I go, so I, I hit an old boss of mine. 
It's so weird. I can't even tell this story. It's t- too long to tell. Oh, no, you gotta go. It's too, You're no, in it's too, too deep long. now. Oh, my God. Give us the elevator version. Okay, so I, I'm leaving a job, and I go for an interview for this graphic design illustration photography job. And the lady, I don't know what I said, but they said, yeah, we have to hire her. So they hire me. Great. And Gina, the, the, the boss, um, I think I worked there for about nine years or so. And eventually I left to go be a freelance illustrator. And one day we're out for lunch and I just happened to mention to her that I'd done an oil painting and it was really, really horrible. And she said, well, that's interesting. I'm, I'm oil painting right now. You should go to this class. So I go to the class and that was sparked my, reignited a love of, of oil, of fine art that I had had many years ago yeah. in college. Yeah. But I kind of let fall by the wayside. But it's just so weird because had I never gone to that job, I if I had never gone to that job interview, I would not have met her. I would not have gone out for lunch with her and gone to that particular place right, right. for instruction, which really reignited my a, a really deep love of still life um, and the old masters. It was just so weird how it all fell so right, perfectly right. into place with no no effort. Yeah. And anyway, it's all taking you down this crazy road. All the roads are crazy, Doug. Oh, they are. I love to I love to write, sit in that chair of mine and, and write and look at all do the... Do you journal? Do you write? I yeah. do, yeah. But I love looking back and seeing how the things fell into place and where you plan and where you do not plan and how things just magically happen for you. Ah, but if you write it down, I don't Something know that it's so magic. Once you write it down, you've... You've willed the world to give that to you. It could be, yeah. I, po- I, I believe in that. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big you write it down and you know ask, believe, receive guy. So yeah, well, I'm. Oh yeah, I'm with you on that for sure. Right, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, what's your sock drawer look like? My sock drawer. Um, do you want me to show you how I fold my socks? I don't roll them up. Okay. <laughs> I don't. We've never I- had that on a podcast. I don't think I'm gonna do that. Although my toenails are, you, are painted an exquisite um, kind of a uh, a really. You got a show now. Well, no, I'm not going to. I think I'll just leave you guys hanging. We around. can edit this, you know. <laughs> if it's if it's if it's you know if there's you know a big what? ghastly hangnail in there, I we're gonna edit it out. No, I've got nice feet. I'm not even, now. I'm not going to show you. Oh. <laughs> but I fold my socks. Podcast number eight. We saw Cindy's feet. Yeah, come on. No, I'm not doing it. All right, you started down that road. So some okay. Thing, some What's in your sock drawer? Be... Let's go back. What's in your sock drawer? Um, oh, what's crying. it look like? On the left hand side, I have some cards and things and some, you know, those death cards you get when people who die. <laughs> Okay, you asked. That's a chick thing. So I put those on the left side, and then I've got a couple of shoe boxes, and the black socks, white socks are to the left. Black socks are, they are folded? to the right. Yes, they all... they're folded in three. So you lay your sock like this, fold, fold. So, oh, my God. And then you put the, the curvy part, not the part that shows like all the layers, one layer, and you put stack them nicely. So, what, like, is this a... You're an artist, but I've been in your studio and there's lots of stuff going it's on messy in, there. in there. I wouldn't say it's messy, but but it's very eclectic. <laughs> so I would assume that your sock drawer would be eclectic too. But are, but do you have some sort of OCD no, n- thing going on where you have to have some order to some things? Um, not overly. It's just that I tend to get a little bit messy in the studio. I collect things. I collect like my stacks of sketches, books which are everywhere, ideas which are are killing me because I've got ideas all over the place, recipe books all over, gardening books all over. And sometimes it gets a little bit overwhelming, the amount of stuff one has and all the mental ideas that's going on. It's like, Jesus, you're just ready to blow right up. Something has to be organized. So I, I like my socks. The socks got and it. Her underwear right. folded the neatly. The socks and the underwear got it. Yeah. Nothing else. Nothing else. The forks and knives are chaotic, no, but the socks are good. No, my husband, he takes care of those. They're perfectly in line. They're all beautiful. All right, all right. Yeah. Well, uh, do, you, uh, do you remember the first painting you sold? 
Oh, wow. Um, I don't... No. You don't? I don't. No, I don't. Well, isn't that interesting? You'd think I, I would have I, I heard don't, about I don't that. either, but <laughs> do you have a memory of... What's the... Do you have a... Uh, how do I even put this? Do you have a memory? What's your first memory of some sort of... I'm going down this road and having success or... or the, I am still laughing about the fact that we just wasted how much time on, on talking about my bloody sock drawer and the color of my toenails. I mean, well, you wouldn't show us your feet, so I had to move on. Oh, we only got 40 minutes. I got it. All right. They're blue. Oh, yeah. Woo. Okay, show us how you fold your sock. Oh, for God's sake. Sorry. Here we go. Okay. Episode eight, how to fold a sock. Well, it's pretty simple, Doug. And then they get stacked thusly. Bo- both the socks. You don't put them together and no. roll them in a ball. No, both so- one, the other sock lays on the other, and then you go like that, and then you stack them. So, nicely. like, if you if you were to take, you know, I know you were saying, you know, insurance and numbers boring, <laughs> but if you were to take a calculator edited. out and, and add up all the time it takes you to fold those socks, how much time do you think you've wasted? It doesn't take any time. It's like. And you don't put them in a ball. Oh, it just drives no. me. Like, put them in a ball. You got to put them together. No. You can't, like... no, it takes up too much room. No, no, can't do that. Oh, right. Waste that's... space. Wow, that's a... That's the way your T-shirt, I fold my T-shirts, my pajamas, all so the... you, Okay, because this is what Michelle does, like too. I take my T-shirts. <laughs> Here's how it goes. I very carefully open the dryer door, <laughs> and I pull them all out into the basket, into the laundry basket, and then I take them upstairs, and I put them on my dresser. And then I take each, I open the dresser drawer and I take each one and stuff them in the drawer and close the drawer. I don't fold them. I don't, und- I take the whole pile and put them in there and go, I like the green one. So I'll take it. <laughs> so I was away recently and Michelle, God bless her soul, the most wonderful person came, cleaned my house and did wow. all my laundry. And when I went to get a shirt out, I opened the drawer and every shirt was folded this like this stacked upright all in two rows and wow. I could see each color. It was the most amazing Isn't organization nice? thing. And I thought, oh my God. And they all fit. And I'm like, and she's a little OCD that and way. And they're not wrinkly. And they're not wrinkly. And it was beautiful. Except the only problem was I opened the drawer. I'm like, oh my God, this is so beautiful. I'm like, oh my God, I don't even want to touch it. It's like, oh my God, I should take a picture. I'm like, there's my green shirt. My favorite. I'm taking it. <laughs> I took the green shirt out, pulled it out, and all the shirts popped out because they were so stuffed in together. And then I stuffed them all back in because I didn't know how to do that. Well, there's a way to take it out. Right. Apparently, and I didn't know that. So I just <laughs> grabbed it. But, you know, there's like 11 shirts in there and it was a little tight. So when I pulled it out, they all went boing and they all popped out and I stuffed them all back in. I felt terrible. But anyways, for like a brief second in my life, I was like, organization. It was beautiful. Yes, it, was. <laughs> it is a beautiful thing. Anyways, we spent 20 minutes talking about your yeah. toes and your socks and that's great. Oh and we God. still couldn't figure out the first painting you ever sold. No, no. Do you remember your first success? What success? Okay, let's let me let me ask you this. <laughs> oh what, boy. What uh what's your definition of success? What is success to you? Oh, well, it'll always change. It's never the same. What's success to you? What's success to you right now? Right now? Well, let's go back. So so there was a time when achieving um like getting in magazines would have been success for me. But then once I got that, so that was fun. So then so so it, What magazine have you been in? I thought, gazillions. I didn't, I don't know any of this. Oh. We have, th- th- we have 30, okay. 30, oh, just what? over 30,000 people listen to this podcast and okay. they don't know. We okay. want a magazine. We want to go buy a magazine that you're Okay. In. Well, I don't do that anymore, but when I was doing it, like, okay, Better Homes and Gardens, a Disney magazine, which I forget the name of it now, Southern Living, um, Canadian Gardening, uh, Westworld oh, magazine, which is Al, totally know that magazine, Alberton yes. or BC ish or something yeah. like that. Um, uh, so what? What do you like? Washington Post. This is a guy who I've never done any illustrative commissiony type. I just paint crop and try and sell it. What What do you get paid for that? Like, what do you? They come to you and and you work with them. Don't work like and and is there contracts? And oh my god, that just I'm already going. Okay, this is why I don't do it. I don't oh even. no, it's not. It's not that complicated. Well, interestingly, um. Before I started doing magazines, I was still interested in children's books. I, I sent, because I didn't want to do all the promotion, because I actually didn't know how. I had no clue what to do. Just, 
So I sent an agent um, some samples, and she sent me a really nice rejection letter back. And so I read the letter. It was obviously a form letter. And I thought to myself, hmm, obviously my work is no good. And, and I had been looking at children's books, and I noticed that some were really good and some were actually quite crappy. And I thought to myself, pardon my language, this is exactly what I said. If that crap can sell, my crap can get published. Right on. And I, and, and I didn't really think it was horribly crappy, but I really did recognize that um, there were some people who were not as good as me and some people who were infinitely better than me. But somewhere in there I fit in and that I could too then if crap was published, my crap would get published, and eventually it would no longer be crappy. So I just kind of kept going, and, and strangely enough, one day an agent found me and, and asked me to come on board. I forget where I was going with this. It's funny how conversations I know, yeah, I know. take a life yeah. of their own. No, but, but it's good. It was all in the success oh, range. The, and, right. So, and, so that was having an agent find me or like my work enough to invite me to join her um group of artists that to represent was, you and go I, sure. I think i could i could take yeah, you somewhere and that, get, get that you some felt successful to me i was pretty happy about that and i liked to you know giving some of that aspect of the job over to somebody else yeah so in terms of what an illustrator does though you were asking so um an, a mag we'll just magazine for example will say we have an article about horses and people who uh uh, do horse jumping and some of the problems that they may have with dressage or whatever. Not that I know anything about dressage, but just an illustration that came to my mind. And so you get this, the article, the script for the article, and they tell you what size. So the sizes are broken up into like uh, spot, which is just like a small, yeah. small illustration, yeah. quarter page, half page, full page or cover. And then you do the art at that time, you would actually ship the illustration off to the magazine where they would scan it and do their thing with it. So, and what happens to the original art after that? Um, do they keep it? Do you get it back? Do they, is I, there a, I think they kept it. Sometimes I think they sent it back. Is there a contract that says, I have to have this back or, or you can only use this for this. You, you don't get the rights to it or is that, oh, oh you, that's a whole deep the, thing. The I rights, mean, I yeah. That's a whole different story because you can, you, someone can have the art, the illustration and you can still have the rights. Yeah. So, and usually that's the way it is with, with, um, magazine illustration with other products. There's a different set of rights. Yeah. It very, right. it varies from, Oh, it, that's super yeah, cool. Very, I, you did so much. That's crazy. Wow. It <laughs> has been a fun career. Have you ever done a jigsaw puzzle yet? Um, you I, should call standout puzzles because I don't think I we have. sell all these standout puzzles in the store. And I keep thinking like I'd never, my thing would never work. It's too, it's just not puzzly enough, but your stuff would make an amazingly good puzzle. You should contact that lady. She's out of Kelowna. She's so nice and so good. Perhaps I will. And y yeah, your your stuff would make killer good puzzles. And then yeah. I could sell puzzles and of yours. That would be awesome. All right. I'd do one at Christmas and send okay. you a picture going, we just did your puzzle. <laughs> oh, it was so hard. I hate that cat. Thanks. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Um, I don't know. I have a. I could talk to you forever. I could. I had a million more questions. There's so many you, so. interesting things about art. I mean, it just there is five hundred thousand. So let's go directions. before we end. Let's let's just go one down one more rabbit hole. Uh, not socks, though, okay? No, no, we're not going down anymore. Right. No. Uh, so <laughs> we'll go. We'll divide this up into. Uh, let's say who's your favorite artist, give or take, and. Who do you look at today that's alive that you're, you know, you, you know, you know, getting in the rabbit hole looking at this stuff. Who, who's, who's your past dead, live, whatever, older, but who, who do you still aspire to? Or who, who's your mentor or the guy that you can like, you always look at for inspiration? Well, oh, wow. Well, because my, my, the art that I'm creating now is all wrapped up with illustration and and fine art so we'll look at both of those so in terms of a fine art my all-time favorite would have to be the various still life painters um like vermeer 
um, uh, Louis Melendez, who is virtually Absolutely. known by nobody, apparently, but you and I in my cookbook. Right, yeah, I know. Oh, yeah, <laughs> um, no, that's, that's the still life uh, king right there. Yeah, some guy called Gerard Traborsch, which also isn't all that well known. But I he, don't know who that oh, is. Oh, my God, he paints unbelievable figures. This, the f- fabric is just stunning. Um, so those sorts of painters I loved. Um, Hieronymus Bosch, which is a little bit out there, but I like to be. I had a bird. But, but, I had a bird called Hieronymus, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I know, yeah, he's. Uh, but in terms of that, it's like some guys are like way out there, but you can extract part of that bits to put pe- into this right. that says like yeah. we need those guys. I think my my thing has always been. In. It's one thing to say, oh, everybody says, oh, paint outside the box, paint outside the box. Well. I've always sort of thought painting outside the box never gets you anywhere. You're always so far out that no one recognizes you. Painting inside the box can be kind of boring. It's the people, I say like Elvis, that painted at the edge of the box right. and pushed the box bigger. They, they they may have stepped outside or grabbed it and pulled it, but they didn't go so far out that you couldn't touch the box. They were pulling it or pushing it and push me and pull you again. <laughs> Let's be the theme in the thing. But, I guess but he so. would push the box and then step outside and pull it. And and lots of guys, lots of artists would, would do that. That's where you create is at that edge of the box where it's different. So who who's alive today like like if you were you know you get your feed and you're looking going oh i get this guy oh i love that guy shit oh i love her i love her um one of my all-time favorites uh how could i forget his name he's russian he's calgarian no he's uh, does podcast he's got i know that guy no he's got the same name he's got the same name as a russian leader not Sergey. Not Putin? No, no. Putin? Jeez, no. Ooh, Putin, I like that. Okay, <laughs> I just on. came from Quebec. I like Guys. Putin too. <laughs> More than I thought. Oh, I'm so annoyed that I can't think of his name. But yeah. he does these incredibly um, vibrant painting. He painted a whole bunch of vodka bottles, labels, labels for vodka Oh, I already bottles. liked the guy. Oh, yeah. He could be my friend. He he's that un- should be my next thing. I'm gonna be <laughs> vodka balls. He's unbelievably talented. I know where to get them. I'm sure. I have a little stack hidden. That's awesome. <laughs> wow, I can't. This is not helping me if I don't know the guy's name. But I know it. It, it just escapes me right now. That's okay. I get that sometimes. Gorbachev. Too. Oh, Gor- like, oh, his Gorbachev. name's Gorbachev, That's like it, the yeah. old Russian leader. Yeah, yeah, Gorbachev. T- tomato head. Yeah, I love um, that. I love that guy. It might be S- Sergey. Sergey Gorbachev. My, yeah. That is a very Russian name right there. Yeah. Very, that, is, that is so Russian, that name. <laughs> Unbelievable very. patterns. Um, We're going to look him up. Do. And if, I, right. and if I gave you his first name wrong, just, just look up Gorbachev and vodka bottle. Art. It'll probably come up, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's beautiful stuff. All right. He's that's... still alive. That's who's inspired. Another person, um, Yuri Borsky, uh, a, a European guy living in the UK now. I just kind of ran across him by accident once while I was doing illustration. And he, he said something to me that always never left my mind. I totally get what he's saying. I, I don't think at the time I really appreciated it. It was like one of those things that kind of went into my head and kind of got filed away and really didn't come out until when I, I think when I was doing the kind of art that I'm doing now. So when I'm when I'm doing what you might think is a very simple flower scene with flowers, branches, and, and mm-hmm, going mm-hmm, all mm-hmm. over, those words of, of Yuri's always come back to me. Yuri Gorbachev. <laughs> Yuri Gorbachev. That's his name. All right. Okay, so so Yuri Borsky's words of rhythm and counter rhythm always come back to me when I'm painting things like that because I'm thinking about the the, the branches and the stems and every leaf in terms of going this way, that way, the sure, space sure. is in between. Yeah, it was a, a, interesting how one little phrase like that will stay in your head forever. It will, and, and it'll affect your art. It really and, has, and yeah. if you can, I don't even know how to say this, but put it in the back of your mind instead of being in the forefront where you're actually just totally using it, like, you know, you got to kind of put it back there and, and let it... Simmer. It just simmers and it comes yeah. out where you're naturally starting to do that and it's working for you those see that that's the that's the shit right 
right there, man. Isn't it? Ezra? It is. It is. It so, is. So, so lastly, before we wrap this up, where are you going? What's next? What's what do you want? Like we started with, what's on your easel? What's next for you? What do you? What you got? Goals? You got something you want to achieve? You want what? What? My goals have changed. So when I was young. I was thinking about, I want to get, be in these sorts of magazines. I want to illustrate children's books. I want to paint cats. And so now I'm actually kind of thinking differently. Now I don't look towards achievement as much. Now the things that I'm thinking about, um, actually, just how can I make my art better? That's actually what I'm really interested right. in. How can I make my art better? How can I always be pushing myself? And what have you got yet to do? Directions? What do you want to do? What's what, what is do one thing that do? you still want to do? Whoa, still want to do. Well, I don't know. I'm really kind of a um the old push me pull you thing. Part of me is a planner. The other part of me is like, let's wait and see what happens. Because really, some of the best things that have happened to me were quite unplanned, like my agent coming along, yep. children's books. Even though they were on that piece of paper, I really wasn't sure how I was going to go about getting them. One day, somebody, a, a, pub a publisher in BC phoned me up and asked if I wanted to do a children's book. Well, so that sparked... Uh, probably a, a series of over 20 kids' books. Wow. So now I've just learned that it really is good sometimes to just let stuff happen and the right things come along at the right time. Uh, uh, maybe, the, maybe the one thing that I would like is I want my cats to be more than just hung on a few people's walls. I love painting cats. I don't know why I'm so drawn to cats, but they're the most amazing, annoying, ridiculous <laughs> creatures. They're beautiful, but they're goofy. They're smart, but they're stupid. They're, uh, they're quite a little bit like people, really, but <laughs> furry with sh very sharp toenails and will puke on the bed as well, which most people don't. Very but, much like people I know. Well, yes. That's a good point. <laughs> but... but I don't know why I'm so drawn to them. My first word as a baby was key for kitty. Wow. I'm sure it must have impressed my parents because I'm not going to say mom or dad. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> I know, isn't that weird? But you you do your cats. You, you I love yeah, cats. Yeah, I want yeah. something to happen to the cats, but I don't know what. It'll come. It'll come. That's right. Something will happen. It's simmering in the pot right now. It's simmering in the pot. All right. Well, hey. All right. Cindy Revel, everybody. You got to look up her cats. She's got the greatest cats and the greatest lilies. And I think if I ever had a house with enough rooms, I would wallpaper my house with one of your paintings. Wow. I'd put like one of your paintings with all the lilies and this. You have the ones with the stripes and it could be wallpaper. Oh, my God. I Doug. think it would be amazing. I do. Pick I, a I, room. Let's get when, when we were at your place and we did the demo thing ages ago. I, I looked at that and said, I would have wallpaper, at least one wall with that painting as wallpaper. I bet Anyways. I know which painting you're talking about. I promise if we ever do this again, my socks are staying on and we're not talking about them. I promise if we do it again, you're, you're, yeah, I know. We'll talk about your socks. So yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, Cindy Revel, everyone. Uh, this is Art and Gibberish uh, for the day. Potato Water Thursday out. Uh, love you dearly. Your friend and Art, Doug. And uh, that's, I'm, I'm Doug and that's Ryan behind the camera. <laughs> Woo! Good night, everyone. And we did speak gibberish. We did. Yeah. <laughs>